Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Martin Slover. I'm a software engineer at SKA. Um, our offices are here in Cape Town. Um, Tafik and I, and that is Tafik Okart, uh, we work in the control and monitoring team. Um, and we'll give you a little bit of insight exactly what control and monitoring is. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, welcome um, to Fee Cockpit. So, just a bit of an overview. So, probably going to run over uh, with SK, SA, our projects, our goals, and those things. Uh, kind of SK, SA, and our relationship with Python. Um, then, we'll give you some intro into like, the uh, control and monitoring uh, problem domain and overview. So, that's what CAM is, it's control and monitoring. And then um, some kind of points on like five years later and the lessons learned. And then we'll give you a overview of the control interfaces if the demo fails. So that's true. So just a um, kind of obligatory meme and uh, kind of disclaimer. I haven't been here for like five years, but I kind of pushed Martin and the team for every uh, five years, like give a talk, and for not every five years, but to give a talk based on the 2012 talk. And we finally here. Uh, so brace yourself for all the images. Okay, so uh, SKSA, so we kind of have the engineering team that's um, down in South Africa, the infrastructure team is down in Johannesburg, and we have uh, the site where the actual telescopes are being built, which is in uh, the Karoo. Right, so when it was established in uh, 2005, it was established with three goals. Uh, the first goal, well, one of the goals were human capital development, and to date, the human capital development has uh, given uh, students over 900 bursaries. Um, they established a YPED program, which is like the official internship program. So, and then that's for students, for computer science students, astronomy students, uh, physics, and it's got quite a big list of that, right? There's an annual graduate uh, conference program that happens. There's the big data summer school. And there's also a kind of push to push uh, in, uh, Northern Cape science and maths. And if you know anything about it, uh, the one of the schools in Northern Cape one uh, or can third in the Lego robotics competition. So there's quite a big push for science and math in North Cape, right? Okay, so that was one of the goals, right? It's when it comes up when SKSA started, right? Um, and then one of the goals was to create a world class telescope. Right? And that's kind of what you're busy with, with Meerkat, and to compete with other telescopes, other radio telescopes. And then the other one is to partake in the, oh, to, to partake in the SKA project, which is an international project. Right, which is the side shared between South Africa and Australia, and there's ten other member countries. Okay, so let me just jump into it quickly. So, Cat Seven, um, it's a seven dish. Uh, so, when your precursor, it was like precursor to Meerkat, was built as an engineering prototype, it was a science experiment really, um, built by some really really smart people. You probably get some of them in the audience and in the other rooms, um, and. It's uh, kind of centre-fed, centre-fed, uh, so it looks like that, you can see at the back, that's CAT7, and the interesting thing is it's still operational from today. So it was an experiment, prototype, but it's still operational and producing science, right? And CAT stands for uh, Karoo Array Telescope. And then we have uh, Meerkat, which is a 64-dish uh, instrument. It's the precursor to SKA, and um, Mir stands for more. So instead of calling it CAT64, it's like Meerkat, and so, so play on the meerkats that are in, the, in that particular area. And then the interesting thing is Offset Gregorian. Um, if you actually know nothing about Offset Gregorian, just think of your DSTV dishes, it's like the way that, that's the way it fits, right? And then it's four bands, it's L, it's X, and it's UHF. And then uh, what we're working towards is SKA-1 MID, which is a 200-dish instrument. It's also a science instrument. It's also Offset Gregorian. Uh, there's five bands. It's planned to roll it in phases. So it'll be two done the dishes, and it will become more dishes later on. And um, the construction phase starts in 2018. <coughs> so it's currently in the planning phase. So we're going to be talking about uh, Meerkat. So in this slide, we just want to um, show a bit more about Meerkat. Both Tafik and I, and, and a lot of the people at the SKA offices, we're focusing at the moment at Meerkat. It's the instrument we're building right now. Um, it will be producing good science pretty soon. Um, and while I talk, those with you with some calculators in the audience, take this number and times it by 64 and get an idea of the data volume that we have to deal with. Um, being in a control system team, 
we've got this privilege of playing with the big toys. So we've got this 42-ton dishes, and we kind of make them move and dance. Um, it's a bit, you know, fun. I like it. Um, they're quite high. I like to fix it. They offset Gregorian. Unlike the Cat 7 dishes, which are a composite fiber, um, fiberglass dish, these are made from a lot of different panels, and those panels have to be aligned. Um, like we said there, there's about 40 panels. One thing that's really interesting about the Meerkat design is that we will have four receivers on the dish. So we can receive in different frequency bands. We've got receivers built that are really specialized in L-band, and X-band, in the UHF band. And, um, actually, our S-band receivers are built by the Max Planck Institute for um, Astronomy in Germany, um, and they put that. And so we can mechanically move the indexer. It sits right about there in the middle. Oh, sorry, not such a great photo. And we can mechanically move this indexer to get the right receiver at the right place. Um, well, the speed that it moves is probably not that interesting. Um, and yeah, we've got quite a big volume of data that has to be dealt with. Um, the control system doesn't deal with all of this gigabytes of data. For that, we've got other systems. I'll explain it now. So just a bit more about the control system. It's, it's a kind of a, a distributed system. Um, we interface to all of the devices um, and subsystems, software components, hardware, and we, we form this abstraction layer, getting everything to work together, um, speak the same language. It's not, um, for all of us who've done engineering, it's not a real-time control system, so it's not typically what you get in, in factories and that type of control systems. It's, it's a definitely a non-real-time the real-time work we push down into embedded devices or localized controllers. It's very domain-specific. It's we, we're building this control system for a telescope. One thing that we do as well that's quite interesting and fun um, is that we have the ability to run the telescope as multiple telescopes. So we've got this concept of a subarray. And at the moment, we have Meerkat configured to be to have four subarrays. Now, this is just an arbitrary number. We chose four. And what these four subarrays can do is they can independently operate as a telescope. So you assign a couple of resources to that, and you do a scientifically or scientific observation while somebody else has got different resources and doing a different observation. Um, these subarrays are totally flexible. And there's nothing specific about one subarray and another one. So now the first point where we use Python. So for scientists to control this subarray, they had to give us an instruction set. And Tafik will touch on this, this a little bit later. But we found, well, we, somebody long ago worked out that Python will be a really good language for scientists to write their observation scripts in. So the scientist will define what he wants to observe, how the conditions of the instrument, and so forth, all in Python. We call these schedule blocks. And these schedule blocks can be queued and executed at certain times. Quite an interesting scheduling. Um, the control system is really a resource manager. Then we use CATCP. Um, there's another slide later that I'll touch on CATCP and give you a bit more of the internals, but it's a client-server protocol, TCP. It's got requests and sensors. Um, like I said, the CAM system is monitoring at the application level. We've got interesting things like we aggregate multiple sensors and form new sensors. We have alarms. We have a specialized GUI. If everything works out, we'll show you a little demo. We've got a nice little client that external systems, external to CAM, can use to connect to us. And then we've got the archiving. Archiving is in there because it's my software. OK, so here's a little diagram. So 
in the middle. It's, it's all about your perspective, you know. If you're in a CAM system, CAM's in the middle of the universe. Um, so if you're in any of the other teams, you'll draw this diagram differently. At the bottom here, we're trying to show the, the large volume, that 35 gigabits per second from each dish coming through. This goes into our correlated beam former, which is totally built with FPGAs. Um, wrapped, the, wrapped with quite a bit of Python logic to make it work. That pushes out, this should be a smaller arrow, the data and the science data processing, where GPUs are really prevalent. And also that is a lot of Python software is being used there. The SDP also then eventually archive the data products. All of this is controlled. It's more triggered by the CAM system. So the CAM system will send triggers to everybody when an array is built to set up. This is the configuration we want. This is the type of observation. This is where the data should end up. And there's environmental controls that we need to take care of. The weather, WX weather, there's user supplied equipment. The building management system is the building on fire. Those type of things we have to take care of. Um, there's many, many more blocks, and we didn't put them all in. Okay. So one thing we've done in CAM is we made sure that everything is abstracted. So we've got a lot of different hardware at the end that ranges from PLCs, specialized equipment, um, video feeds and cameras and controllers that we had to specially build um, for reasons of, of RFI, um, which is another long topic. And so we had to really abstract that. And, and for that reason, we've, we've written proxies and translators over all of these hardware bits. Um, and then we went, with these proxies, we've also got the ability to restrict and control who and what processes can access everything. Then there is certain hardware bits, which is the interface is maybe not so difficult to abstract, but it, it requires several commands to start up. So if we send a start to our proxy, we maybe have to do um, sensor checks and, you know, a couple of requests and commands to get that process or that piece of equipment to start properly. All of this, all of our CAM proxies is written in Python, and in all cases, they end up giving a CAT CP interface. Um, nearly homogeneous. We can't get that right yet, but we're working towards like having all of the proxies being exactly the same. <coughs> so I'm going to write to, um, so who uses CAM? So you, so you particularly have like three types of, you, uh, three, you can categorize the users <coughs> into three sections. You'd have your engineers, which would be your mechanical, electrical, electronic, uh, your software, your system engineers, um, your computer engineers, and they'd be doing testing, they hardware the system, debugging the system, they do some development, and they also do some qualification, right, uh, of the system and particular parts on the CAM system. And then you also have your operators, who are usually astronomers, physicists, uh, software engineers, electronic engineers, and they kind of monitor your telescope, uh, they manage issues that arise, and they kind of run the scripts, uh, observation scripts for the scientists, right? So you have your, your astrophysicists, um, your astronomers, and your computer, science, computer scientists, right? Of your scientists, and they kind of perform and track observations, and they kind of create historic data and do data processing. So these aren't the all the use cases, but this is just some examples of the use cases to give some context into how we use uh, Python, or how they use Python. So, so when the engineering team, um, so kind of testing and debugging is really important for when they're parsing out particular hardware devices. So they they need like an um, uh, scripting interface into the system, right? Uh, they also need to probe the systems. So they need to kind of query the, into the system. Um, when you do your qualification, they need some kind of documents that can run, uh, which can be produced after the systems are fully run and automated kind of qualification. So in that particular case, we use uh, software that worked well for us was um, we kind of use Tornado a lot. For everywhere, it's kind of like our choice of our for our kind of web stack and for our TCP IP, we use a lot of uh, kind of Tornado for our service. We just spin up a server 
we use Tornado. Uh, we kind of use Nose a lot for testing and we use a lot with uh, kind of for, for things for documentation and there's a slide about that later. Um, we love IPython. Uh, kind of you can control the telescope from IPython and go see that later. And then we also kind of, uh, there's a big drive by some of the other subsystems in using um, the Bokeh server that interfaces with our server to work, easy graphing and kind of just visualization of data, right? Then uh, the operators, they have kind of similar, just put a few of this um, kind of uh, software, uh, Python packages and kind of big software, software packages they, that they, they enjoy using. Um, and you see like IPython, Jupyter, and the notebook, uh, you see Tornado a lot, you see kind of uh, Matplotlib a lot, especially when they're doing kind of the analytics, they, uh, kind of the, if they're doing issue logging, you, you they're probably sending it to some Tornado server, since some of the servers, and um, again, scripting interface, which is, which is Python, and to also inspect the telescope through IPython. And then kind of the scientists, it's, it's not particularly limited, these aren't all the use cases, but it gives you an idea of like what they use. So, I mean, the kind of use case would be storage, it would be um, kind of machine learning on it, some sensor data querying post. Um, when, so when they actually get the data, they want to do some sensor data query to, make, to verify that there wasn't interference from other devices. And these are just really a few of these uh, libraries. You could probably just ask us questions later or get me in the corridor and ask me what other packages they use, right? This just give you an idea. So it gives you an idea of like kind of where, our, it's not like the, your Django and like what other applications everyone else is using. It's a different kind of domain. Okay, so when you go back, um, if you go back like five years ago and I asked a few of the people at uh, uh, the institution, so at SKA, say like, what is the reason? Why did you choose um, Python? And what they needed was they needed to, um, operators needed to like uh, have a low level interface to do root cause analysis, um, easy to learn, and easy to extend, right? Also, commissioning scientists needed a, a scripting framework to allow them full control of, of different subsystems, right? And then also engineers needed an interface to get the job done. So when they're passing out something or when they're testing something on site, and um, kind of. Uh, software development had to integrate um, to everything imaginable, right? So the thing that kind of sold Python was like the philosophy of Python, like the Zen of Python, which is on the side over there, if you can read it. Like just a few of these things, that like kind of readability counts when you're working up across um, multiple kind of, when you're working with engineers, uh, scientists, kind of operators, readability kind of really counts in that, right? And then if you go back to, um, the 2012 talk from one of our senior, kind of um, uh, Simon, um, uh, he co quoted this, life is too short to write uh, C++ code. And it kind of gives an explanation of why a lot of the old astronomy data is written in Fortran, and it kind of goes on. But um, I'd like to like quote one of my favorite uh, characters. So kind of like, well, that's Robert Baratheon. Um, if you want to watch Game of Thrones, so he like, says over here, like, which is better, right? Um, five or like one, right? And then he says like, uh, okay, I'm just paraphrasing, so he says like one, it's like one language, a real language, united by one organization with one purpose. So like, you kind of have that, instead of like t five different languages working with like all four tankers, you have like Python, and everyone can work with it, I guess. So that's just the meme, um, the kind of obligatory meme. Uh, so uh, just, a quick, uh, this is done um, yesterday on a dev box, so please ignore the, uh, ignore the Piper packages might be a bit, um, yeah, that's not accurate science, but the 50 and the 150 might be a bit uh, inaccurate because on a dev box, but this is quite accurate with kind of like the growth in our code base from Cat7 to Meerkat. So Cat7, what we did with Cat7 was we kind of just shipped a lot of Cat7's code and used it within Meerkat, and we took out what didn't work and built onto it, right? Um, Martin will kind of explain more on that and what kind of changed in there, I guess. And um, yeah. Okay. So if I've mentioned before about CAT CP. Um, this is really the cornerstone of, of the control system. Um, and our very own Simon Crossy is the lead author on the original specification. Um, and a lot of other people in the Python community have at some stage. Um, been involved with SKA, either worked there or just ad hocly involved. And CATCP is one of those things that there's been so many um, contributions and, and different opinions about things, but at the end it, it works very well for us. We, we're very happy. 
quite recently, in the last three years or so, we've moved it into um, an asynchronous library, um, and we've, we've decided to use Tor Tornado for that. That has paid off very well for us. We've been able to have a much simpler interface, um, and you know, um, the, the thing that people always uh, claim with your asynchronous libraries, we've got much better concurrency, um, and it's worked very well for us. CatCP is a text-based protocol, so we can use Telnet to to fix or Telnet to go in and 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 use and control it. It's client-server based, so it's not a message bus of some sorts or uh, any distributed. Is a client connects to a server, a server receives many, many client connections. Um, what is also quite cool about CatCP, and I've been using some other control protocols lately, is that with, with CatCP, all of the control is per connection based. So if a client connects with a certain census subscription or a certain logging pattern, that is per that connection, which helps a lot and makes it quite advanced. We use it on all of our subsystems. We've got many external vendors also using it. Um, and it's got requests and sensors. And I'll touch a bit more on the sensors. Sensors is just, well, as you can imagine, a sensor. But we push all kinds of things for sensors. Strings and lists and, and basically anything that we want monitored and stored, we push for sensors. <laughs> It's not Python 3 yet, but we really want it to be, and we'll get there. I think we're going to finish building Meerkat first. <laughs> okay, monitoring archive. Um, Tafik allowed the slide in because this is my work and my passion. Um, we've got two aspects. We've got the near real-time interface, which distributes sensor samples outside of the CAM system. Um, I'm going a little bit faster because I would like to show a bit of a demo at the end. And then we've got the, the long-term archive. Um, in the near real-time distribution, we use Tornado web servers with WebSockets and external um, well, subsystems. And we've even got this Meerlich telescope in Sutherland that connects to um, the Meerkat telescope. And it tracks in the optical spectrum. If Meerkat is only at night, of course, if Meerkat is doing a certain observation, Meerlicht will then also track and do an observation of the same patch of sky. Not quite sure what they'll see, but it, um, it will be interesting if there is an event and we've got it in both spectrums. Um, for that, we've written a cat portal client, which just basically makes it easy for people to connect. That cat portal client is open source, so you can find it. We use a message bus and the publish subscribe pattern. In our long-term archive, this is um, at the Postgres conference, I okay, have a long talk, but I'll make it short. Python really shined here for us because we used the Postgres SQL database and we were able to extend the database by writing functions in Python. So we didn't have to like kind of kill kittens and small children by getting our PL SQL stored procedures to work, we could just write them in Python, which helped a lot. We could extend it by writing foreign data wrappers, which is a way that you create a federated table so your database looks like it's data, but the data is somewhere else in Python. Um, and for this project, we use Python 3, the async IO library, and that is awesome. Okay, so. Our system is fully simulated, and we put a lot of emphasis on testing. And this is one of the places where, especially from my background, that Python has been really awesome. Um, it's an easy language to write tests. I mean, there's absolutely no excuse if you don't test your code in Python because it's so, so, so easy. I mean, sometimes you write C code, and it's like hard to write a test. So you just say, mm, but it works. But in Python, it's so easy to write tests. We've got no excuse. Um, again, fully simulated, so we've got all of this hardware I was talking about. We can write simulators for them. Um, and that allows us for a developer to have a full control system on his laptop. Okay. Hmm. No, you go. Okay, cool. So some of the lessons learned, and I calculated from some senior um, engineers, 
And things that like really popped up was kind of like the Python allows to optimize later. So there's one particular package that the science processing team um, worked on, which was called Speed. Which, and uh, what they did was that they wrote the initial speed in um, in Python and used NumPy, and then they kind of, if you think it was a talk uh, two years ago by uh, Bruce, Bruce Mary about how he uh, used Boost, and they rewrote kind of uh, speed to write. It also allows you to like, in our case, with uh, foreign data wrapper and uh, Postgres, so you can write in Python. And uh, later on, you can just write into a C extension, right? So the other thing is picking up on a, picking a good kind of uh, asynchronous framework early, which was a good choice. We picked up Tornado early, worked with Tornado, and Tornado's Python 3 compatibility is quite nice, right? Uh, Python allows for thorough testing tools, especially if you're kind of in an engineering environment, you're something thorough testing and has kind of mature document or documentation tools, and if the code's documented itself, it's really good. And then I think one thing that's really important, um, kind of uh, Simon also mentioned this, I mean, it's kind of, a Python has a really awesome community. So like you're developing, you're working with your science, you work with data science, and you work with Python, and the community is really grow growing, 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 and new tools are coming out constantly, and like you mentioned, Dask, and there's a few other tools you also mentioned, but it's, it's really mm -hmm. just, Python has a really awesome community, and like, thank you for that, like everyone over here. And um, that's that's just a few of the lessons. I'm just rushing through them because we want to get the demo up. <coughs> cool, so time for the demo. Oops, that's a giveaway. So in this one, I just want to, um, I want to show you the, the GUI, but I also want to show you the IPython interface. So I want to, not quite sure how we're going to do this with our time. But here is the story where I said we've, we've built in subarray. We've got nine receivers in the subarray. We've got the CBF, and, um, the bot at the top, um, and we've got the SDP. Um, and this is now a working telescope, all of our um, devices is nice and green. Here we're running an observation script. Um, this is one of the scientists. He submitted the script. The script is busy running. If I click on that red button, he's going to kill me. Um, but fortunately, I have logged myself in as a monitor-only user. So I'm not stupid. I've done it before. <laughs> <laughs> um, here are some other um, observation scripts that's completed. Um, each of our observation scripts has got like a ton of I interesting information and you can spend hours picking through it and seeing what it does. Um, there's the criteria, so it basically at the end it runs a script and that's where we store the script, it's track.py and, and he wrote that in, in Python. Actually, they reuse the same script all the time and they just pass in different parameters. And those scripts are, are really nice and convenient. Um, we give them an, an object, we call it cat, and they use this cat object, Karoo Array Telescope object, in a context manager. So if they forget to close, it closes itself and it cleans up. Um, and in, in that script and in that context manager, in that environment, we've got lots of cool little useful functions to make sure that they don't break stuff. Also, that object only gives access to the resources that was pulled into the subarray. So which would be these resources. There's obviously another resource that they, another backdoor that, that we can get stuff, but we don't tell them. Okay. Just a pointing display. This one's just always easy to see, and if things refresh quick enough with the Wi-Fi and VPN. Okay, so I'll just speak while it loads. Um, this is just uh, always a nice display, and we actually have it up in the office for um, visitors and school groups that gets there. And it basically is a polar plot, and it shows you where all of our dishes are, are pointing at the moment, and if you were to look at it, Long enough, yes, there are some moving. You can see some of them are moving. So certain of the observations, they will track an object through the sky. Um, if it is something that's nice and fast moving, maybe they are tracking a satellite just to characterize the signals it's sending at the moment. Um, this nice multicolored bar is just showing in what subarray things are in. Okay. 
How come the tough one? The live demo. One minute to go. Okay. So we, we provide the operators with this interface. It, we use IPython. And in this interface, we have a cat object. And you can see connected to cat object, there's all the receptors. And you can go cat.m001.sensors. And then you can see all the sensors it had, has. And let's say comes OK, because that will. OK, the value is true. We know we connected. And we can get a status. And we say it's nominal. <coughs> and now I'm rushing. And I'm nervous because I'm doing a live demo. So now it's going to go all wrong. Okay, so we can do stuff like we can print the actual elevation of a whole bunch of um, dishes. So this is just the elevation. And I asked it to print it in one second, all of them. And fortunately, I made some crypt notes. I go. And why Python is really nice for this interface is once they've learned Python and they kind of have the concept and they've got like Lisp comprehension under the hood, they can just go like, okay, um, for A in cat.ant, which would be all the antennas in the system, um, give me the names. Okay, that's boring. And my time's up. I'm going to steal time. Okay. So we want to know the which pressure did I take? The helium compressor. So as a receiver, we want to keep the receiver cold. Cold receiver is good. Um, and we want to know the pressure. That's the pressure. There's some zeros in there. Why? Well, they're off. We don't care about the off devices. Then we just carry on with list comprehension. I know you guys know where this is going now. And then you can go there. If statement in. And so, so it's really powerful, um, and if you once they know Python, quite easy to use. That's us. Thank you. Oh. I can read that. Just as a closing remark, this is our first light image. It doesn't look so awesome here. Um, it is quite a scientific or a uh, significant image. It was the first taken. It was only taken with 16 dishes. Um, the, for me, it looked like a black background with spots on, because I know very little about astronomy. But the scientists are quite excited. They um, can find 1,300 things there, where they previously could only find 70. So, And that was with 16 dishes, so we hope to be have even more impressive images when we have 64, which will give us much more sensitivity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some time for some questions. Uh, if I could also ask uh, for a volunteer from the audience who could run around with the microphone. Please. Anyone? Volunteer? Ah, there we go. So, questions? Oh, yes, we have a question over here. Well, it seems a pretty obvious question, but I see you've got 64 antenna on your system. Have you taken that same picture that you do the 16 again with the 64? And if not, is there any particular reason why not? Um, you... Um, oh, so you're talking about our first light image. Yes. Okay, so not all the uh, dishes are, how would you say, ready and commissioned yet. Okay, and at certain times, yeah, um, at that stage when we, we did the 16 observation, we, we, that was one of our targets, is to get to 16 and do a viable observation. It's also... Um, there are some scientists in the audience, so I must be careful. Um, but you, you just can't take any 16, okay? They're in certain patterns and certain, certain configurations won't 
work as well as other configurations. So if you have the 16 all around the edge and you use them, it wouldn't be scientifically viable or significant. I think. Another question in the front here? Um, you said that the, the receiver um, was mechanically um, switched. Does that mean you can only have one receiver on at a time? Uh, that is, that is that's correct. So uh, think of it as in your radio that you can do AM and FM. So you don't want to do AM and FM at the same time. So what we do is um, it's within the subarray. So we can have, um, let's say, 16 dishes doing UHF observations, and we can have 16 other dishes doing S-band observations. Okay, and I will carefully work out which dishes will do what and, and, and characterize it. Um, and it, it's, it's literally mechanical. It's a thing that moves like, it's called the indexer. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers. Uh, uh, I noticed that the dishes are arranged in some, I think, somewhat random way. I don't know, is there uh, a specific reason for that kind of spatial relationship they have? Uh, I would be the wrong person to explain this perfectly to you, but there is a very special pattern to it. Um, there's a thing called a baseline, which is the distance between any two dishes. And they were arranged in such a way to have, the, I'm just going to say, the correct distribution of, of baselines. So a lot of thought was, was put into, into that pattern. Right. Yeah. yeah, if you have more questions about that, I think you <laughs> can ask um, Matthew. Matthew. Yeah, Matthew is the one that I saw. Thanks. Questions back here? Um, I might have misunderstood it or missed it because it was just a small footnote that you made that you mentioned did you so you said something along the lines of you kind of rent parts of the array at a time to different kinds of scientific inquiries at a piece of time do you have some sort of algorithm that manages which uh, dishes they're going to be using at any given time so for example you mentioned that they're in specific arrangements in order to be able to do certain things. Do you have some sort of thing where a person goes, oh, I'm tracking this fast moving object, and you have to schedule which dishes are gonna be active for that around. Do you have some sort of scheduling system for kind of dynamically managing those resources? Or do you just go, here's a bunch of antennae, do whatever you can within the limits of these antennae? And it's an easy answer, not yet. Um, <laughs> at the moment, uh, while we're still building Meerkat and we, we're still commissioning, it is really the latter. It is like, this is what we have. Let's use it and let's see what we can get. Um, later on, there will be more um, intelligent scheduling algorithms and scheduling tools. And there's a, there's a whole suite of ideas um, on that. So. Um, yeah, I'll stick to my not yet. We have time for one more question. Okay, one more. Okay, then you after that gentleman. Yeah. In, in terms of the software, is there something that you wish you'd done differently five years ago um, that would have made life easier today? <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy that we uh, use Python. Um, I don't know, like everyone we spoke to, I guess, or most of the senior people, so, um, senior personnel, or senior engineers at uh, SK we spoke to. So like kind of the technical lead of the um, control and uh, monitoring subsystem, she was like quite happy that we're using uh, Python. Uh, she comes from a C++ background mm -hmm. and also kind of in uh, that particular field and she was quite happy with it. If you're looking at where the control community is going, also a lot of them are pushing towards, I mean, sorry, I didn't mention it, but um, SKA Mid is also choosing Python as a core language and C++ kind of as a secondary mm -hmm. language. And I think Simon was, without a doubt, uh, the head of the, kind of the, the technical lead of the science, he was without a doubt, no regrets on Python. So, you know, what else? Yeah, yeah there's, th there's uh, there's probably not something I can publicly mention that we should change, um, but, 
um, we, we climbed on the async bandwagon too late. Um, that would be one thing that was umming and ahhing for, it was in my first year, we were umming and ahhing about it a lot and going like, mm, should we, should we not, mm, it's too complicated. That is something we, I don't know, we should have just bucketed up earlier um, and done that. That worked for our use case, worked very well. We've got many, 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 many connections and, and things, and it's all kind of, it's not really CPU bound, it's all IO bound. And that was one thing I think we should have pushed much earlier. Um, okay, one thing maybe that building a time series database <laughs> in Python, <laughs> that's a bit yeah. crazy. That, uh, that is the, the archiving, we are, one of our initial uh, things was building that in Python where that really struggled, so we, we really had some performance issues. Um, eventually, th that one, we, we offloaded a lot into Postgres, um, which helped, we should have, with that especially, like, you know, kind of, um, how would you say, been, been honest with it earlier and said, okay, we're not gonna be able to get this fast enough in Python and just moved it off. Um, and that's that's nice what what the community gives you because there's all these tools out there, um, and if you just look for them at the right time, it works. So. Okay. So, so, um, you mentioned that um, your your data transfer rate something like 35 gigabytes a second times 64, which I assume are the dishes. So as, I assume then as you're bringing more dishes online, if you have a massive data quantity you have to store for analysis. So my question is, how do you handle that as you're bringing more, I mean, exponentially your storage requirements are going up, your throughput requirements, and, and where you store that and how you store that, how are you dealing with that? Yeah, so, fortunately, um, as it goes through the processing pipeline, it's reduce, 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 reduce. At the end, it is huge amounts. There are, I saw an observation, I don't, really get involved with the observations that much, but I saw an observation the other day with a file of 600 gigs that comes out and that gets shipped off to the scientist. Um, there are, um, and this is probably uh, going into other teams and other subsystems, but they are big projects to, to create large storage pools, several tens of petabytes storage systems are being built at the moment that we will use for archiving the scientific data. But we don't store that that raw data. So we have, it's approximately 35 gigabits a second coming from each of the dishes. That, um, I'm gonna go really over time because this is an interesting topic. Um, <laughs> that all goes into the correlator, um, CBF, the correlator beamformer. And those who've done radar systems or signal processing will be much better at this than, than myself. Um, and in the correlator, we've got these really big Xilinx FPGAs that just crunch down the numbers. Um, and, and that output is then pushed into the science data processing team where they have just a bunch of machines, um, the ingest systems um, with GPUs crunching down these numbers until you have a much smaller processed product. Um, and those smaller, I mean, like I said, 600 gigs, um, for an observation, it, but that is more manageable. So we fortunately don't have to store all the raw visibilities. Um, in times that we do, I think we just capture them directly to SSD and, and store certain, certain portions. Well, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're out of time and we have to move on to our next talk. <laughs> and thank you.